Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this week's edition of the Triangle Area SQL Server Users Group. We have the Advanced DBA Group this month, second Tuesday after all. It's hard to remember what day of the week it is, much less what week of the month. But I have a calendar invite, so that told me it was the second Tuesday. So tonight we have Pam LaHood talking to us, coming to us from Microsoft to talk about TempDB. So without further ado, let me hand it off to Pam. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, everybody. Um, I guess good evening to you. Good afternoon for me because I'm uh, in Seattle. Um, so today I am going to talk to you, as Kevin said, about TempDB. Um, so I will start. Oh, hang on. Let me get my PowerPoint. There we go. I will start with a little bit about me. So I am a program manager um, at Microsoft in the SQL Server group, um, and I'm my Primary responsibility is for the storage engine area, which includes things like backups and TempDB. Um, I also do some work um, with SQL on Azure VM um, and you know various other things um, that have to do with SQL Server. And you can see me on Twitter as SQL Goddess. So what we're gonna talk about today is um, TempDB because, you know, um, I've worked with SQL Server for a really long time. Um, and when I was a DBA, I know that um, TempDB was a serious pain point for me. And I've, of course, uh, as a support engineer at Microsoft um, or as a premier field engineer at Microsoft, um, I faced a lot of issues with TempDB. And I know it's one of those things that's kind of the bane of every DBA's existence. Um, so when I came to the PM role in the product group and I learned I was going to be responsible for TempDB, I was like, wow, scary, but also super cool because I could actually hopefully do something useful <laughs> for DBAs. So um, what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about is just kind of the history of TempDB and why it's so important, why it's become such um, an issue, why it's so integral to performance in SQL Server. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the different contention points that can happen in TempDB um, and what you should do to help mitigate those issues. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about you know, what good TempDB configuration looks like. And also, I'd like to talk a little bit about the improvements that came in SQL Server 2019 uh, that are directly related to TempDB and performance, including the new uh, memory-optimized TempDB metadata feature. And I'll do a little demo around that. Um, so as we go through, I mean, this is a user group, which normally I like to just be a super informal conversation. It's a little harder to do that in this virtual medium, but I do encourage you to ask all kinds of questions. Um, I've got slides that I'm going to go through, um, but if we don't get through all the slides because you have so many amazing questions, I'm totally happy with that, and I'm totally fine to just answer any questions you guys have. So as you have questions, please feel free to, to type them into the chat and Kevin will relay them to me um, and I will get to as many of your questions as possible. So don't be shy, um, definitely speak up. And if you want me to go in a different direction or go deeper into any topic, please let me know or let Kevin know and he'll let me know. Okay, so let's start with a little bit about TempDB. So what? why are we even talking about it? What makes it a thing? Why is it so special? Basically, it's just a database. It's modeled the same as your other user databases. Um, the structure is the same. The you know It's got files just like any other database. It's got pages, it's got tables, it's got metadata. Um, the difference with TempDB is that it's recreated every time the server is restarted. So unlike your user databases that are persistent, Every time you restart SQL Server, we recreate TempDB from scratch. Um, and because it's meant for temporary storage, everything's minimally logged. So we, we because we're going to throw everything away, um, we don't have to worry as much about durability as we would in your user databases. So everything's minimally logged. The major difference for TempDB is that the workload's going to be different. So for your user databases, you've got data that's stored there that you're going to access and modify and, and change and view and all of that. For TempDB, it's temporary storage, right? So it's not, you're not storing data here for long term, you're storing data here simply because you need a scratch area to store some data. Oftentimes, it's being used 
when you don't have um, enough memory for something and you need to spell to disk, you use TempDB. So it's non-durable um, and you're frequently creating and destroying objects because again, it's not persistent. Most So when you create a temp table in a session, uh, that temp table goes away as soon as the session goes away or in the case of a stored procedure, as soon as the stored procedure execution is done, the temp table automatically goes away. Um, so this kind of frequent creation and destruction of objects is one thing that's usually quite different than a user database. Uh, the other thing is it's very high concurrency. There's only one TempDB on an instance of SQL Server. So if you have several different applications accessing your instance, they're all gonna be using TempDB. And generally, many of your queries are gonna end up uh, leveraging TempDB for at least some things. And so you end up with a lot of sessions that are uh, working in TempDB at the same time. Um, and the last point here is that it's actually very critical to performance of your workload. Um, so as I said earlier, data that can't fit into memory is stored in TempDB. So the access needs to be fast. If we, if we were storing that data in memory, it would be super fast. So having to spill to TempDB is gonna make things slower. Um, so I need that TempDB to be as fast as possible so that it doesn't slow my workload down too much. And often it's used to store intermediate query results. So if, if you look at your execution plan, for example, and you see um, a spool, that's, you know, that may be TempDB storage. So, so this could be a direct impact to query performance. Any delays on TempDB could be directly felt by your queries. So critical to performance. Okay, so what goes into TempDB? Um, a ton of stuff goes into TempDB. So obviously temp tables. Um, table variables, um, uh, you know, a lot of people have the misconception that table variables are in memory only. That is not necessarily true unless you've created a, a, a memory optimized table type. Otherwise, table variables do get stored in TempDB. Um, row versions. So if you're using, um, for example, uh, read committed snapshot isolation, um, then that turns on the row version store, which is stored in TempDB. There's other things that use row versions like triggers, for example. Um, so uh, that will be stored in TempDB. Hash work tables, so in your, again, in your query plans, if you have hash operations, those work tables may be stored in TempDB. Spools, I mentioned earlier, triggers uh, as they use row versions. Um, cursors, in some cases, depending on the cursor type, there may be um, data, intermediate data stored in uh, TempDB. Um, sorts, so sorts that spell to disk will spell to TempDB and sorts for if you're doing index operations with sort and TempDB. Um, online index operations, we're creating, again, we're kind of leveraging that row version idea, creating versions in TempDB for that. DBCC CheckDB creates shadow copies in TempDB. Table valued functions, um, even statistics updates um, can store information in TempDB. So there's it's just kind of a dumping ground for all kinds of temporary storage. Anytime somebody needs temporary storage in SQL Server, it's gonna get dumped into TempDB. So uh, uh, what do DBAs think of TempDB? I always go back to this um, analogy that Brent Ozer used. He called it the public toilet of SQL Server, which is obviously not a very nice um, connotation, but that's kind of where what it's ended up uh, over, over the years. So, um, so that's a little bit about TempDB. I guess maybe now's a good time to pause. Does anybody have any questions? before we start moving on into the, the mechanics behind TempDB. So if you do have questions, drop them into chat and I will pass them along. There is about a 15 to 20 second delay. So usually we'll have to vamp for a little bit before the first people can get their questions typed in. Okay. I'll pause for a couple of seconds. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, Yeah, so I'll... far no questions. Oh wait. Okay. Uh, don't oh <laughs> yeah okay yeah no questions that okay. was a comment a comment yeah okay so um so i'm gonna go start with a little bit of history of sql server so we'll start way back in sql server 2000 specifically sp4 and <laughs> the reason i focus on sp4 is um th there were some things that were introduced back in the sql 2000 time frame and if you've been a dba for a while um, particularly a SQL Server DBA, um, you know, back then is when we really started to see things like larger number of cores, a lot more memory. People were starting to use um, 
more than four gigs of RAM. Like, I don't know if you guys remember that whole AWE switch and the PAE switch and all those things. We, we started getting a lot more memory in SQL Server and we started getting a lot more cores. And with that increased concurrency, new contention points started presenting themselves in SQL Server. And one of the major things that happened was we started seeing contention in TempDB, particularly object allocation contention. So, so this is the kind of contention that happens when you're creating, um, creating objects in TempDB or really any database, but particularly in TempDB because of the frequency with which we are creating objects. Um, so we started seeing this contention. So right around that time frame is when this KB came out and this was the only KB number I ever memorized in my entire career, 328551. There have subsequently been a few more KBs and there's newer KBs that address the same kind of TempDB performance issue, but that was the one that came out. And this was the first time that we started saying you should have multiple files for TempDB and you should consider enabling trace lag 1118. And those recommendations came out in that time frame specifically to address object allocation contention in TempDB. Okay, so what is object allocation contention? Object allocation contention is contention on special pages that are in any database really. In this case, we're talking about TempDB, but you have these same pages in user databases. And these are pages that store information about where objects are stored inside the file. So if you look at any file, this um, on the slide here, I have an example of um, a data file, in this case, tempdb.mdf. And the first, and these are, would be the pages, right? So page zero is a header page. And then page one is a page called PFS. And PFS stands for page free space. And um, the job, this page's job is to track the free space in the next 8,000, eight, about 8,088 pages. So 8K, and we are just determining how much free space is on those pages, and that gets recorded in the PFS page. So, and then every 8,088 pages, there's another PFS page, okay? So the PFS page is used anytime I wanna find a page that has free space, I need to use that page. The next page is what's called a GAM page. This stands for Global Allocation Map. Um, and this maps out extents. So an extent is eight pages in SQL Server, and that's kind of the unit of allocation um, for, uh, for objects. Um, and so this tells me whether the next 64,000 extents, whether they're allocated or not. So it's just a bitmap. If the, the bit is zero, then that GAM has already been allocated. If the bit is one, then it's then it's not, or, or it's reverse. Sorry, I can't remember what that is off the top of my head. But anyway, that's what maps out um, whether the pages are uh, free or whether the extents are free or not. And then after 64,000 extents, there's another GAM page. Okay, so the next is the SGAM, shared global allocation. So an extent is 8K pages. If I have an object that's smaller than 8K, um, I or that's smaller than 64K, um, I might not wanna allocate a whole 64K to that object. I might wanna allocate just one page off of an extent instead of a full extent. So if I wanna allocate just um, one page instead of a full extent, then I would use this shared global allocation map. And it's the same kind of thing as the GAM. It's a bitmap that describes the next 64,000 extents. And if the bit is one, then it means the extent is a shared uh, mixed extent and it has free space available. If it's zero, it means it's not. So that is tracked. Um, that tracks anytime I wanna allocate a single page rather than a full extent. Um, so why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because anytime we need to allocate an object in a database, we need to use these pages in order to find space to put that object. So if I have an object um, that's smaller than 64K, I use the PFS page and the SGAM page to find space to put that object. If I wanna allocate a full extent, then I use the GAM. So what can happen in TempDB is I can end up with contention on these pages because I've got lots of threads, lots of different workloads that are all trying to allocate space in TempDB at the same time, and they run into contention on these pages. And so what that contention looks like is a, a page latch wait. Um, that means it's an in-memory wait. So it's not page IO latch, which would be a disk 
IO related weight, it's an in-memory contention, which is page latch. For the PFS page, it's page latch UP is, is, is the latch that you'd see. And so what happens is you'll see a page latch weight on this number, two colon one colon one. And that stands for two is the database ID for tempdb, one is the file ID, and then this last one is the page ID. So this stands for um, the PFS page. So you would see page latch contention on 211, and that would tell you, oh, I've got this tempdb object allocation contention. You might also see 213, which would be contention on the SCAM page. So the, the way you get around this type of object allocation contention is you create multiple files because the any all the files in the database all have the same structure. So they all have the same set of pages. So if you can take the workload and spread it out across the files, then you'll have separate copies of these PFS and GAM and SGAM pages, and you can spread the work out across all of those files, which will avoid the contention. So this is object allocation contention in TempDB, and this is the reason for that recommendation to have multiple files. So you need multiple files and you need those multiple files to be equally sized. And the reason they need to be equally sized is that the way that SQL Server allocates space across multiple files in the same file group is by using what's called a proportional fill algorithm. So that means it tries to keep all the files the same amount full. So if one file is larger than the other file, then the file that's larger will get more allocations because it's larger and we're trying to keep it the same percentage full across all the files. So if they're not all the same size, then the larger ones or the ones that have more free space, those are gonna get hit harder than the ones that have less free space. So if we start with all the files the same size, then we can turn that proportional fill algorithm into a round robin algorithm where every subsequent allocation hits a different file. And that's, what, that's why you have to have multiple files and they have to be equally sized so that we spread that object allocation access across all the files, okay? So that's the reason for that recommendation. That recommendation is still valid today um, because you can still get PFS contention today if you don't, um, if you don't have these multiple files, okay. So that, um, so that's the reason for that recommendation. Now, another type of contention that we started seeing in the SQL 2000 timeframe was um, metadata contention in TempDB on the system tables. So what this is is there are a series of system tables that track all the different objects in a user database. There are about, in TempDB, there are about 12 that are hit regularly um, for table creation. And so these system tables, and they're the same ones that you have in your user database, these system tables track things like, you know, what are all the objects that are there? What are all the columns? What are the definitions, the data types? You know, all that metadata about all the objects. Um, all of that is stored in system tables. And so what started happening in SQL 2000 is anytime you were creating tables in TempDB, if you had lots of threads all trying to create tables at the same time, they would end up um, getting contention on these metadata tables. And again, this was latch contention, the same kind of thing you see for object allocation, um, because all of this is in memory because they're used so frequently. Um, but when you've got lots of threads all trying to modify the same page in the system table, then you get latch contention on the system table. So the difference here between this and the object allocation contention is that the page numbers would be different. For PFS, it's 211. For metadata pages, that last number, the page number, will might be different. Um, so, so this metadata contention was happening just because we had we're creating lots of objects all at the same time. We're trying to insert this metadata all at the same time, and we ended up with contention there. Now, um, this doesn't get solved by creating multiple files because there's only one set of system tables for each database. So there's no, there was no way to get around this metadata contention. There was no configuration option you could change that would help with this metadata contention. So what we did in 2005 was to introduce temp table caching. And temp table caching was used to, to help get around this metadata contention. Um, and so with the temp table caching, we can uh, remove that create table step because once the table is created, it goes into a cache. If anyone needs to use that table again, 
the, the, we don't drop the metadata. We keep the metadata in the table. So rather than having to create the metadata again, we can just pull the object out of the cache. The metadata is already there and we don't have to make those modifications. So that temp table caching helped us get around that metadata contention. So that together with creating the multiple equally sized files um, helped us to um, get around all that contention on tempdb. So that was back in 2005. Okay. We also in 2005 started putting a lot more weight on tempdb because new things that were added in 2005 are the row versioning. So all the, the snapshot isolation, recommitted snapshot isolation, all of that was added. Table variables were added in 2005. So we started actually putting more into tempdb. So not only are we trying to mitigate existing issues with tempdb, but we're also adding new things to tempdb. And oh, by the way, we're also adding new metadata because as we start introducing new complex types, um, we actually introduce new metadata tables. So the problem of metadata contention kind of starts getting worse over time. So fast forward to 2014. Now we introduce in-memory OLTP. So that's your memory optimized tables. Doesn't really have anything to do with TempDB now, but it has to do with TempDB in 2019. So that's why I talked about that here. Um, SQL Server 2016. Um, we we noticed over time that uh, while we published best practices for tempdb not everyone reads that kb article that tells you to create the multiple tempdb files so we were finding that yeah we had this recommendation out here but there were a lot of customers who didn't know that that's how tempdb should be configured and so we had a lot of customers calling in with issues for tempdb performance and not knowing that these were the best practices and because we realized out of the box the default configuration for sql server was not right for tempdb so in 2016 what we did is we now made all of these things the default so the multiple files um trace flag 1117 and 1118 become the default let me just talk a bit about those because i haven't mentioned it yet so trace flag 1118 is something that we can use for uh, to get around that object allocation contention. What that does is it turns off mixed extent allocations and make everything a uniform extent. So it shifts the burden from the SGAM to the GAM page. Um, but there's since we're allocating eight pages at a time, there's there's many fewer allocations that have to happen when you use um, uniform extents versus mixed extents. So that's so trace slide 1118 kind of helps shift that contention off the SCAM page. And then trace slide 1117, what that does is when if you have multiple files in the same file group, when one of them auto grows, they all auto grow at the same time. So that's a trace slide that you can use to keep all the files the same size and keep that proportional fill algorithm keep that working as a round robin algorithm for you. So those became the default behavior for tempdb, multiple files, and all of this configuration was added to the setup wizard. So now in the setup wizard, you're prompted for those tempdb best practices. So if you're on 2016 or later, you may not have any of this history of, of bad tempdb performance because you've been kind of encouraged to have these best practices right from the start. But if you're on older versions, you need to pay attention to, um, to these best practices and make sure that they're in place. Okay. And then we also introduced um, an, something called optimistic latching for the metadata. And this was a way to overcome metadata contention, which by the way, kind of came back. 2005, it, we helped a little bit with the temp table caching, but it still was an ongoing problem and it got even worse in 2016. So I'm gonna talk about that optimistic latching in a moment. So I think probably now is another is a good time to pause for um, other questions. Do we have any questions, Kevin? Uh, no questions so far. Although, if there are any questions, folks, put them in chat. I will do my best to vocalize them roughly in the words in which you typed. <laughs> okay, great. But yeah, nothing so far. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to keep going. Um, if if you have a, I know you said there's a delay, so if if, if questions come in, um, feel free to stop me, but I'll also just go ahead and set up the next topic because I do wanna talk a little bit more about this optimistic latching. So these were improvements, like I said, that came in in 2016. So let's kind of revisit that metadata contention problem and talk about what we did in 2016. So you recall, I was I, when I introduced the idea of metadata contention, I said it's happening on this on these system tables and we introduced temp table caching to get around it. So without temp table caching, 
this metadata contention was happening when we were creating tempdb files. So we have lots of threads creating tempdb files at the same or tempdb tables at the same time. They're inserting into the metadata tables um, as they create the tables, and we were getting contention on the metadata tables. So then we introduced temp table caching to get around that problem. Well, guess what happens? With temp table caching, now, great, we, we're not getting the problem on the create, now we're getting it on the drop. So what was happening is anytime a cache object was invalidated, so for example, if you have a stored procedure where you create a temporary table, and then later in that stored procedure, you modify that temporary table, like say you create an index on it, for example, that's kind of a common pattern is to create the temp table, put some data into it, and then create an index on it. When you do that, you're modifying the definition of the temp table. That invalidates the cache object. So that means we would have to delete the object at the end of the stored procedure. So then we started getting deletes, um, or sorry, getting contention on the deletes when we're dropping the temp table from the cache. So, so we kind of shifted the problem. Each one of these things that we introduced helped uh, alleviate the problem, but then it ended up just moving the bottleneck further down the line, and that's what happened here. So one thing we did in 2016 is we changed the way the latching algorithm works. Because remember, I've, I've mentioned um, earlier that this manifests itself as latch contention. So what you'll see is you'll see threads that are sitting around waiting on page latch. So what we did, the old latching algorithm, right up front, we get a page latch EX, which means an exclusive page latch. So when the thread gets an exclusive page latch on the page, um, it means that no one else can touch that page. So anybody else who's even trying to read the page, they won't be able to, re to read the page at all. They'll just have to wait. So we get this exclusive page latch right up front, and then we scan for the metadata and see if we find any rows that need to be deleted. So we're gonna drop the object out of the cache. We have to scan all the metadata tables. Remember I mentioned there's about 12 of them. So there's actually quite a bit of metadata we have to look through. And as, um, at, you know, as SQL Server gets uh, more modern and newer versions, we have actually more metadata because we have more complexity. So this problem actually gets worse and worse. Um, and so if we find, if we don't find any rows, then we can just release the page latch right away. If we find rows, then we have to delete those rows and then we can release the page latch. So we can, we hold the page latch the whole time while we're scanning for the metadata and then while we're deleting the metadata if we find it. So what we did in 2016 was we introduced this optimized latching algorithm. So we acquired the page latch, but shared rather than exclusive. And so instead of getting that exclusive latch right up front where no one else can touch the page, we get a shared latch. And then we scan for the metadata under the shared latch. If, if then we find metadata that needs to be deleted, at that point, we promote to an exclusive page latch, we delete the metadata, and then we release the latch. But if we don't find any rows, then we just release the shared page latch. So this really reduces contention a lot by moving to this optimistic latching algorithm. So that was something that changed in 2016. Okay, so then 2017, um, a few more improvements. So uh, we, in 2017, again, as people start using TempDB more and we get larger systems with lar more, many more processors, lots more workload, concurrent workload, these problems just kind of snowballed. So we did a little bit more in 2017. So PFS round robin algorithm, we changed, the, we changed the way we round robin between PFS pages so that we can avoid object allocation contention more. Um, we also created an async metadata cleanup, which I'll walk through in a minute. And then we revisited the optimistic latching. We did that in more areas. We'd only done it in some areas. We did it in more areas to trust, again, try to address um, the contention issues that were coming up in 2017. So let me talk a little bit about this PFS round robin fix. Um, so in 2017, and I've listed out the CUs because this actually went all the way back to 2014 SP3. These are the CUs um, and, and service packs that have this improvement. So what we did here is normally when you're allocating an object and we're doing that round robin across the files, 
what'll happen is the first allocation will hit one file, then we'll hit the next file, and the next file, then the next file, and then we would go back to file one, file two, file three, and we would do it that way. But remember that there are multiple um, PFS pages within the file. So with this improvement, now we round robin across all the PFS pages within the files. So we do one, two, three, four across the files, and then five, six, seven, eight across the second set of PFS pages within that file, and then we go back again and, and do it again. So basically, we're not just round robining across the files, we're round robining across all the PFS pages in all the files. So we're again just spreading those allocations out, not just across the files, but within the files as well. So that's just another way to address uh, that object allocation contention. Okay. Um, so the latching algorithm, remember, uh, we basically took the same change. We didn't change this at all. We just applied it to more places. So that was done in um, 2017 CU7, um, in SP1 CU9 in 2016, and in SP2 CU1 in 2016. Okay. So now is the super complicated thing. Now here's what we started doing to um, try to get, again, this metadata contention, which just kept coming back to bite us. So in 2017 CU5, 2014 SP3, and 2016 SP1 CU8. These are where we introduced this asynchronous metadata cleanup. So this gets super complicated. Um, so we have, what we did is we just said, okay, whenever you drop a temp table, whenever anything gets invalidated in the cache, that just becomes a no-op. We don't actually delete anything. We don't drop the table. We don't delete the metadata. We do nothing. A drop becomes nothing. So then what happens is we, we only rely on memory pressure to trigger things to actually be deleted. So when we need to clear something out of the cache, then we move it to the deleted list. And then we have a background process that actually takes things off the deleted list. So we take temp tables from the cache, from the deleted list, and then we go and find the metadata and drop it. So this becomes asynchronous. So no longer does the temp table drop itself trigger the cleanup. Now it gets cleaned up later in a background task. The problem with this is that background thread can't always keep up with all the metadata that it needs to drop. So if you've got the cache filling up very quickly and you need to remove things quickly, then what we did is say, okay, every thread that needs to create a temp table, all of these threads, I want you to help clean up metadata. So any table that we, any uh, thread that was gonna create a temp table, it then had to go and delete a, a temp table from the, uh, from the deleted list first. And so then again, we just, again, shifted that contention down to the cache cleanup on the deletes instead of having it when we're actually creating or deleting the tables themselves. So we're just kind of moving the contention around. So what we did is we said, okay, let's not have every thread be a helper thread. Let's just have one helper thread per NUMA node. So if you've got a server that has multiple nodes, which most of your servers usually, if they've got more than four cores or, or eight cores, they're probably gonna be divided into NUMA nodes. Um, then we'll just have one per NUMA node. Okay, and if there's any questions, again, feel free to drop them in the chat. I don't really want to dig deeper into um, what NUMA is and NUMA configuration. So if you have questions there, let me know. I can address them after. But um, so basically what we did here is just reduce the number of threads cleaning up metadata. And so that was helping with the metadata contention as well. Okay, actually, it's also a, another really good chance to pause for any questions. Uh, because I'm going to move on into what we did to really address metadata contention um, in 2019. So again, if there's any questions on the history or the background, now's a good time to drop those in. I am you... patiently awaiting. Okay. Okay. So no questions yet? Uh, none okay. so far. Okay. Great. Um, so then... What I will say is that um, that's everything that has kind of been done up until 2019. Um, so the, the long and the short of that is where we're at today, if you're not on 2019 yet, your only options for addressing TempTV contention, if you see them, are to, again, continue to create those multiple files. So hopefully if you're on 2016 or later, you already have multiple files and you already have those trace flags enabled, so that's great. 
Um, but if not, then you want to make sure you have those proper configurations in place. But for this metadata contention, there's really nothing you can do unless you can upgrade to 2019. You can, of course, make sure you're on the latest service pack or cumulative update. Um, but uh, but it still happens even in, in 2017. So um, so there's really no specific relief for this problem until we get to 2019. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about. So we do have one question. Um, okay. Is soft NUMA affecting the one NUMA node cleanup? Yes, soft NUMA will impact that. So it's one per new, per either soft or hard NUMA node. One per NUMA node, soft NUMA will impact that. That was great. Good. Thank you. Okay. All right. So yeah, again, keep feel free to keep um dropping in questions if you have them. I'm just gonna keep going until Kevin tells oh, me he's gone. There's another one. There's okay. so once once the dam breaks, they all burst through. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when we talk about contention, what would we see as a weight type to indicate this? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I'm gonna cover that more in the demo when I get to the demo. So I'll show you exactly what to look for. Um, but basically what you'll look for is any session. So if you're looking at say DM exec sessions, for example, or um, SP who to or something like that, if you're looking for a session that's got a weight type of uh, page latch. If it's the PFS contention, it'll be page latch underscore UP. If it's metadata contention, it could be page latch EX, it could be page latch SH, um, but it'll be some flavor of page latch. And then the weight resource is what tells you whether it's TempDB contention or not. So if the weight resource is 211, then it's it's a PFS page in TempDB. If the weight resource is 21, let's say 62 or something like that, then it's probably metadata contention. Um, so I'll give you some examples of, of how to look for that contention when we get to the demo. Also, actually, this is probably a good place for a plug. Um, we we did start working on a TempDB health report for Azure Data Studio. So if you guys run Azure Data Studio, um, there's like a server dashboard that's built into Azure Data Studio and there's a new TempDB report that's in there. It's not the um, prettiest looking report yet, but that'll also help surface um, either object allocation contention or metadata contention. Okay. Great, thank you. Yeah. All right, so new and improved. All right, so <laughs> Once we got into 2019 and we started doing performance testing in TempDB, we started uncovering all kinds of um, new temp table cache contention that was happening. Now, first, of course, is the metadata contention. We got several customers coming to us with 2017 that had severe metadata contention. And a lot of it was simply um, they weren't leveraging the temp table cache efficiently. So um, I, I mentioned to you that. Um, you know, if you modify a temp table within a stored procedure, it invalidates the cache. So um, while we don't immediately drop it at the end of the stored procedure, we do eventually have to drop that thing out of the cache. It's it's it can't be reused. So so any that kind of behavior means that you're not leveraging that temp table cache effectively. So we found a lot of customers that had to make sweeping code changes to kind of get around this metadata because we didn't have a good way to address it on the SQL server side. So that's what we've been talking about this metadata contention. So the way that manifests itself is as page latch weights as I was just talking. The next thing we started to notice is that the memory object itself, the temp table cache memory object, we saw contention on that. And that would typically manifest as CMEM thread weight. So that would be the weight type CMEM thread. The problem with CMEM thread weights is there's a million different things that cause CMEM thread weight. So there's no way to know for sure that it's a temp table cache problem unless you actually called CSS and, and they did some deeper analysis for you. So I can't guarantee that if you're seeing CMEM thread weights, it's this. But um, this is one of the things that happened. So we realized that we needed to do some changes around the, the, the temp cache objects themselves to make that a little bit more efficient. And then the other thing we noticed was some inefficient um, uh, usage of um, the cache store objects or the hash tables that are used to store the cache objects. So what you would see is um, SOS cache store spin lock weights. Now, again, I really don't have enough time to go into spin lock. So if you don't know what spin locks are, I would encourage you to do some research on spin lock. For this one, 
you wouldn't see a weight type. There's no weight type for spin lock. It just looks like high CPU to you. So um, there is a way for you to look at spin lock stats. There's a dynamic management view called sys.dmos spin lock stats. I think that's it. I'm just going off memory there, but um, that's that's how you would see if you had this SOS cache store spin lock contention. Now, again, there are other things that can cause SOS cache store spin lock contention, but TempDB became a big contributing factor. We started seeing this again in 2017. Okay, so we had a bunch of different things we needed to address. So summarize. Object allocation contention. So that's contention for metadata pages used to manage the space. You look for page latch weights on the PFS 211 and the GAM page 212. Um, metadata contention. So again, this is contention for pages that belong to the system objects that are used to track the table metadata in TempDB. You look for page latch weights on pages that belong to system objects. So how do you know it's a system object? Well, you know it's in TempDB if it starts with two. Um, the, the page number will tell you if it's a system object. So you'd have to actually look up the page number. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And then um, temp table cache contention. Again, this is ca contention on the memory objects themselves that are support the temp table cache, um, CMEM thread or SOS cache store spin lock weights. Again, this is much more advanced debugging. So it, for that, you're probably opening a case with CSS to know for sure whether you're having that. So those are the different flavors of TempDB contention that you might be having. Okay, so what are we doing? We as in Microsoft, how, <laughs> how are we fixing this and what can you do um, to fix some of this? So uh, as I mentioned for configuration, again, th this hasn't changed over all the years. We still recommend multiple equally sized files. How many should you have? That's a big question. People are always asking, well, how many do I start with? The current general best practice recommendation is one per core. So one TempDB per core, no more than eight to start and increase as needed. So in other words, if you've got 128 cores on your system, chances are you don't need 128 TempDB files because you're probably not going to have 128 threads all trying to create a temp table at exactly the same time. So you probably don't need that many. So we generally recommend start with one per core or eight, the lesser of the two, and increase as needed. So what's that as needed? If you start seeing page latch weights on PFS pages, then you need more files. And there's definitely workloads um, where you have 128 cores and you need 128 TempDB files. I'm not gonna say that they're not out there. You definitely have some workloads that have that severe TempDB contention. It really depends on what you're doing in the application and how you're leveraging TempDB. So, so you may need that many, but most people don't. Most people can, can go with eight and they'll be fine. When you increase, we, we recommend that you add four files at a time. It just seems to work out better for, um, for the algorithm to increase in multiples of four. And also keep in mind, remember what I mentioned earlier is that these multiple files being equally sized, we're doing that to trick that um, proportional fill algorithm and turn it into a round robin algorithm. So what happens is, let's say you 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 just you have eight files, and you decide eight files is not enough. You're going to need to add more. So you add four more files. Do you need to restart SQL Server? Well, technically, no. You don't need to restart SQL Server. You can just add the files, and then we'll start using them. But remember, you just added four empty files. So you had eight files, which may be at least partially full, and you just added four empty files. So what's going to happen? SQL Server is going to hit those four new files until they become the same amount full as the first eight. So what can happen is if you add new files to TempDB and you don't restart the instance, you're going to hit those four files for a while until you start bouncing across all 12. So even though you don't have to restart, it's a good idea to restart the service after you add those new files. Because when you restart SQL Server, we recreate TempDB across all 12 files and they'll all be empty. And so right from the beginning, you'll be bouncing across 12. So it's, it's a good practice to restart the instance after adding new files. Um, if you're on 2014 or earlier, you do need to enable those trace flags yourself, 1117 and 1118. If you're on 2016 or later, you do not need to enable those trace flags. They are already enabled for you, or at least the behavior behind them is. 
Um, so version, as you saw, I, we, we had lots of improvements for TempDB, so it definitely makes sense for you to take advantage of the latest CUs. So make sure you're on the latest CU, the latest service pack, uh, so that you can take advantage of all of those improvements. Okay, ignore that thing about trace like 3427. I'm going to cut that out of here because we fixed that in a later CU. <laughs> um, okay, and then uh, code changes. So I, I mentioned that a lot of these metadata contention problems happen because um, your application is not leveraging the temp table cache appropriately. So in order to be sure that you're able to leverage the temp table cache, you want to make sure that you do not alter temp tables after they have been created. So the way you can do that is by moving any index creation statements to the new inline syntax. So when we introduced in-memory OLTP, we introduced the ability to create indexes in the same statement that you create the table. So um, if you do that for your temp tables, it means that those indexes get created right away. And that means that we're able to cache them and reuse those cache objects. So it's a good idea to do that rather than to create the temp table and then put data in it and then add an index. When you do that, we will not be able to reuse that temp table from the cache. Um, so even though you may think it's a performance hit to, to insert into a table that has indexes on it already, it's probably better to do that than to not be able to leverage the temp table cache. Um, do not truncate temp tables. The reason for that is a truncation of a temp table is a metadata operation. So that's one more thing that hits metadata. Um, and then avoid using temp tables inside ad hoc batches. We only cache temp tables when they are part of a stored procedure. So if you are doing ad hoc batches against SQL Server and you're using temp tables in an ad hoc batch, those will not be cached. So that's another thing that can put pressure on your metadata. Okay, so we had all these problems. What are we gonna do to solve them? Where could we go? One thing is people have been asking us for a long time, why is there only one tempdb for each instance of SQL Server? Why don't we have one tempdb per user database? Um, and it seems like that would be a good solution. However, it doesn't actually improve scalability for a single user database. So what I mean by that is, if I've got an application that has massive concurrency on a single database, then having one tempdb per database isn't going to help with that problem. And most of the customers that we see that have this issue, they don't necessarily have lots of applications on the same instance that have different databases. They just have one massive application that has con that has major concurrency that is on a single database. So having one tempdb per user database wouldn't really solve this particular problem. At least it wouldn't solve it for, for a large majority of, of customers. So while there may be other reasons why having one tempdb per user database would be a good idea, in this case, it wasn't enough to solve the problem. Another thing people have asked is, couldn't we just do in memory? Couldn't we just do um, you know, all in memory tempdb? Um, and we can't, you know, this is another good idea. Um, and it, it does seem on the surface like that, like this would solve a lot of problems. However, the problem is with in memory OLTP, the way it exists today, it's a very different uh, pattern than your normal data tables. So there's different data structures and different performance patterns. Not all the data types, not all the surface area of your regular user databases is supported with in memory OLTP. So this would, again, it wouldn't meet everyone's needs. So we couldn't go with like a pure in-memory OLTP tempdb. So what we decided to do is a, a, cup, a series of improvements. Um, so one thing is this new thing that people are calling the page cracker. Um, and what the page cracker does is it's really just a DMV. It's sys.dmdb page info. And what this allows you to do is in combination with this function fn page rest cracker, what this allows you to do is uh, see what kind of a page it is that you're looking at. So for example, we know that I told you that 211 is a PFS page, but what if you didn't know that? You could feed 211 into sys.dmdb page info and it would tell you, it would give you the header for that page and then that would let you know what kind of a page it is. 
So you can use this to find out whether pages are, are metadata pages. So if you feed a page number into DMDB page info and the metadata will tell you which object uh, that page belongs to. And so if that object is one of the system objects, then you know it's metadata contention. So this, was an, uh, this is a nice way to be able to determine whether or not you're having this contention. Um, and this takes the place of a DBCC page. So DBCC page is, I don't want to call it undocumented because it's referenced in a lot of places in our documentation. It's not officially documented, but it's kind of lightly documented. Um, DBCC page is a way that you could dump the contents of a page and then you could determine which object that page belongs to by looking at that header information. But running DBCC page, you can't do it programmatically like with within another query. And you also need to have sysadmin rights to be able to run that. So DVCC page is not the nicest, most user-friendly way to get that information. So, so DMDB page info helps you get that information in a scriptable way. Um, accelerated database recovery, you don't necessarily think of this as a, as a TempDB improvement, but what accelerated database recovery does is it leverages a new feature called the persistent version store. Um, and the persistent version store is stored inside the user database. So instead of doing the version store in TempDB, it moves the version store into the user database. So what this means is if you turn on accelerated database recovery, or ADR as it's called, um, then if you're also using uh, read committed snapshot isolation or snapshot isolation, instead of having that row version store in TempDB, RCSI and snapshot isolation will use the persistent version store instead. So it's a way to take some of that weight off of TempDB. So less things going into TempDB and, and moving into the user database. Um, so the accelerated database recovery is something you would have to turn on. We also made some default changes. So these are things that just installing SQL Server 2019 will give you these improvements. Um, so one is temp table cache improvements. Um, and that is um, those, remember I was talking about the um, issues with the temp table cache where you could have CMEM thread weights or SOS cache store spin lock weights. Um, we did some changes to the way the temp table cache is structured to get around those issues. So we partitioned the memory object, we <clears throat> avoided some unnecessary lookups and things like that. So that's uh, by default in 2019. And then the other thing that's kind of flown under the radar a little bit is concurrent PFS updates. So another thing that came in 2019, and again, this is on by default, is um, we no longer have to get um, an update latch or an exclusive latch on a PFS page in order to update it. Um, we're using what's called an interlocked operation. So that's kind of a, 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 we're shifting that concurrency management to a lower level, to the CPU level. So since, we're can, we, since we can manage that, at the CPU level, we no longer have to do it at the latch level. So you will now see all updates to PFS pages will happen under a shared latch instead. So the cool thing about that is no more latch contention on PFS pages. So um, you do still need to have multiple files because right now um, you can still get GAM contention. So you can still get GAM page contention on object allocation. Um, but PFS uh, contention should go away in 2019 because of this concurrent PFS updates. So that's cool. And that applies in user databases as well as um, TempTB. So if you happen to have one of those unique workloads where you actually see PFS contention in a user database, that should go away as well in 2019. And then the last opt-in feature and the one that I'm going to do the demo about is memory optimized metadata tables for TempDB. So the idea behind this improvement is to take a little bit of that uh, in-memory OLTP technology and leverage that to get around this metadata contention. So everything that I've been talking about today has really come down to latch contention, page latch contention. And one of the benefits of in-memory OLTP is that it doesn't use latches. It's latch-free and lock-free. So by leveraging memory optimized tables just for the system tables, we're able to keep the same disk-based tables for your workload. So when you create a temp table, it's still a regular old temp table that's written to the data file as it normally would be. But the metadata about that table 
is now being stored as a non-durable memory optimized table. So because TempDB gets destroyed and recreated every time we restart it, there's really no reason for anything that's written in TempDB to be durable at all. So that includes the metadata. So by moving them into um, non-durable tables, um, not only do we get that latch-free, lock-free structure, but we don't have to log any of those operations. And we don't even have a disk, uh, an on-disk file group for these. You know, Normally for in-memory OLTP, you have checkpoint files on disk. Because these are non-durable tables, we don't even need to checkpoint them. So you don't even end up with a memory optimized file group for TempDB. It's just the in-memory part. So by this, by using that in-memory OLTP for the system tables, we can make metadata contention completely go away altogether. Okay. And so that's an opt-in feature. That's something you would have to turn on. So for the rest of my presentation, it's all going to be demo. Um, and uh, you may know that the the code word for um, in-memory OLTP is Hackathon. If anyone talks about Hackathon, they're talking about the in-memory OLTP. And so um, the engineer who designed this improvement likes to call it Hackathonize. He Hackathonized the TempDB metadata. So that's what we call it, Hackathonize. So I'm going to switch over to my demo machine and get that all set up. So again, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to drop them in the chat. And um, we'll have uh, Kevin relay them to me, and then I'll go ahead and switch over to the demo. Yeah, the one question we had had, you actually answered, which was, oh, when okay. are we getting rid of TempDB? Well, I I, when are we getting rid of it? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't completely answer that. When are we going to get rid of it? I mean, I don't foresee a future without TempDB. <laughs> um, there may be changes coming coming down the pike, um, but I, I I don't see a future where you'll you you won't have TempDB at all. <laughs> yeah, the discussion about um, TempDB and user databases it was something that I had thought about before, so it was good to hear yeah. the the reasoning of hey, here's why it won't really work everywhere. Yeah, here's what here yeah here's why it won't work, and I'm not saying there aren't like I said I'm not saying there aren't other reasons like there's containment reasons. Um, there's maybe there's also been some talk of could we have one TempDB per availability group, for example, if we're using availability groups. So, I mean, there's reasons why we might have multiple TempDBs, but this particular problem, it wouldn't be solved by that. So yeah, that's why we didn't go that way. Okay. So again, Kevin, do feel free to stop me if more questions come in, but. I'm just getting my. Mm -hmm. Oops. Okay, so I assume you're seeing. Yeah. Okay, so you're seeing my demo screen now. Okay, so what I'm using here, and I'll 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 just stop a little while and and kind of talk a little bit about Azure Data Studio. A little plug for Azure Data Studio. If you haven't played with Azure Data Studio yet. It is such a cool tool. Um, this is kind of the future of, of um, SQL Server database management, Azure Data Studio. Don't be fooled by the name. Um, SQL Server is part of Azure Data. We are part of the Azure Data family. So Azure Data Studio works for SQL Server. It works for all versions of SQL Server as well as Azure Data, um, Azure databases, and even um, I think you can even use it against like Postgres databases in Azure SQL uh, in Azure Database. So um, so this is a very cool tool. And one of the nicest features is notebooks. So um, my demo is done completely in a Jupyter notebook. And I'm going to walk through this with you. This is something that you can put together yourself. And I also have these demos on, uh, on GitHub. If you look in um, the SQL Server samples repository, I think if you just do a search for SQL Server samples, you'll come to our GitHub repo. And there's a bunch of. Um, of sample code in there and this notebook as well as many others are there. Um, if you go to aka.ms slash SQL 2019 notebooks, you will find a whole bunch of really great um, demo notebooks for you there. At any rate, we're going to uh, explore TempDB metadata. So I've already got my AdventureWorks database and um, I have created a stored procedure called USP employee birthday list. It takes a month as a parameter. And what it does is it creates a table called birthdays. 
or hashtag birthday. So that's my temp table. Um, and uh, it's just got an, a primary key. I insert some data from my human resources table into the birthdays. So basically any employee who has a birthday for the month that I'm sending in, that is going to go into the birthdays table. And then I'm gonna do a more complex query where I get uh, personal information about that employee by joining to the birthdays temporary table. So this is a relatively common pattern that I see a lot of customers use temp tables for. They create like a list of IDs and then they do a much more complicated join for just that list of IDs. They're doing that to make this simpler. They could just add this same uh, filter condition to this query, but then this query becomes really complicated. So this is a uh, one technique that people use to simplify their queries. So that's kind of a common TempDB pattern. So that's what my stored procedure is doing. And what I'm going to do in my demo is I'm going to use the OStress tool um, to send multiple threads, uh, just executing the this stored procedure over and over again. And what I've got here is a query that will help me um, detect the, the metadata contention that's happening. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is start up my performance monitor. And I'm going to use this so that you can kind of see the workload coming in. And then I'll get my um, OStress running. Okay, and so what you'll see here is you've got some batches that are starting to come in, and you're also going to start to see some page latch waits. A decent amount of page latch waiting, and about 300 or so, just under 300 batch requests per second. So that's the white line there is the batch request per second. And then here, the white line is now showing page latch waits. So you can see I've got some page latch waits happening. So I'm going to come back to Azure Data Studio, and I'm going to run this query. And what you'll see here is, and so mainly what I'm looking at here, let's just focus on this query a little bit, <clears throat> is I'm looking at DM exec requests, and I'm looking for any sessions that are waiting with a wait type like page. So I'm looking for those page latch waits. And so what you can see in the results here is a number of sessions, a large number of sessions that are all waiting on page latch EX. Okay. So I've got uh, 94 right now, 94 sessions that are all sitting here waiting on page latch. And I can tell that this is metadata contention because the object that that page belongs to is this sys schema objects. This is one of the system tables that is um, commonly involved in metadata contention in TempDB. Okay, so the way I got that was by using that new um, DMDB page info and the FN page res cracker. So in SQL 2019, um, DM exec requests has a new column called page resource. If the weight resource is related to a page if it's a page type so like a page latch or a page lock or something like that if if the weight resource is a page then there'll be this new page resource value and then you can use the page reg page res cracker to separate that page resource into the database id the file id and the page id and those are the parameters that the dmdb page info function takes and so that allows us to see the header information for the page. And from that, I got the object name, which is the schema objects. So this is what metadata contention in TempDB looks like. And my batch is completed. So I'm just going to pause my, temp, my uh, performance monitor for a, a minute. So you can see that took about 1 minute and 50 seconds to execute that batch with 120 concurrent threads. OK. So we know we've got metadata contention here. Now, if this was object contention, again, you would see uh, instead of 21120, it would be probably like 211 or 213 for the GAM page, or sorry, 212 for the GAM page. 
And then this would usually for PFS, this would be page latch underscore UP. But um, for metadata contention, it could be EX or SH. For the object allocation, it's usually UP. Okay, so we know we've got this metadata contention because I can see that I'm contending on this schema object. So what I'm going to do is try out the new um, memory optimized TempDB metadata in 2019. This is a very simple alter server configuration, although it does require a restart because remember TempDB gets recreated every time we restart SQL Server. And in order to turn this on, we have to enable a bunch of that in-memory OLTP infrastructure to get this to work. So we run this and that turns it on. But then if you look at the, and then um, we've got a couple ways to tell whether it's on or not. One is this server property is TempDB metadata memory optimized. So let me just run that. And that still says zero because we haven't restarted yet. There, you can also use SP configure. So SP configure will give me config value versus run value. So here I can see, yeah, I turned it on, but I haven't restarted yet. So my run value is zero. So I'm just gonna go ahead and um, restart the SQL Server. I'm gonna use Management Studio because that's something that Azure Data Studio just can't do yet, fortunately. By the way, um, while I'm waiting for my instance to restart, I did want to also mention that, where is that here? There's a, I'm trying to remember how to get to that server dashboard. Oh, there it is. Okay. So this is the um, server dashboard here. And so there's this is where um, you can get some information about the um, about the instance, kind of similar to how Management Studio works. But this is where the new, I'm sorry, I don't know where the new TempDB, there is a new TempDB report here, but I can't remember how to get to it from here. So I'll have to, uh, have to refresh my memory for the next time I do this demo, so. But, uh, Look out for that for for um, for the different um, dashboard reports that you can get in um, Azure Data Studio. Okay, so hopefully that's restarted. Let me just refresh and make sure recovery is completed. For some reason, my database has been taking a long time to recover lately. Yeah, it's still in recovery. So we'll give that another refresh. And again, if you've got questions, do feel free to, there we go, it's recovered now. So we can move on. Okay, so I'm gonna um, close that and I'm gonna come back up here because we're gonna run this query again. Let's just get everything set up. So let's go ahead and start our perfmon again. And then I'm going to run the workload again. Okay, so now notice that our batch request per second is significantly higher than it was before we turned on the memory optimized TempDB metadata. So Originally, we were just under 300 batch requests per second. Now, we're just under 500, we're around 450 or so batch requests per second. So we've got much higher um, batch requests per second. And also notice, no page latch weights. So they've completely gone away. And if I come back and run our query again, where I'm looking for page latch weights, you can see there's nothing. So just by turning on, that option, the memory optimized TempDB metadata, we've completely removed the page latch weights. And we can see we've significantly increased the batch request per second. Now, how much will this improve your workload? Again, your mileage may vary. Um, not everyone has severe TempDB contention. So what you wanna do is 
analyze your server and be, be on the lookout for that page latch contention on those metadata pages and see if this is the kind of thing you have. Um, and then, you know, if you've got really severe contention, this can actually help quite a bit. So you can see that finished a little bit faster. I'm gonna go ahead and pause this. So we went from the batch um, taking one minute and 50 seconds to taking one minute and 13 seconds. So we shaved almost 40 seconds off the runtime of that simply by turning on that option. Okay, so that is the new uh, memory optimized TempDB metadata. And like I said, this notebook is available on GitHub. Just look in the SQL Server samples, or you can go to that link that I mentioned, aka.ms slash SQL 2019 notebooks. And you will find not only this demo, but several other really great demos. There's one on accelerated database recovery. There's one on, um, there's several actually on the IQP, intelligent query processing features. So a lot of the new um, SQL Server 2019 features have notebooks out there. And so you can go through um, and do your own demos um, or just do your own learning um, by looking through these notebooks. Okay. So um, time for more questions. So again, if you guys have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and Kevin, let me know if anything comes up. Yeah, it looks like we have a question. Uh, would this memory option work with SQL Server 2017? No, this is unfortunately only in SQL Server 2019. And because of the complexity of the change, this is not really something that we can backport. Um, so we won't be able to bring this back to older versions. You'll need 2019 or later. Okay, um, that was the first question so far. Let's okay. see what else comes up. There's been a lot of discussion about notebooks in here. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So if you do have other questions about anything you've seen so far, maybe haven't, uh, does this impact other memory optimized tables? Does this impact other memory optimized tables? That is a very good question. The general answer to that is no. However, there definitely are some limitations. So that's a good question to bring up. Um, one of the limitations of um, in-memory OLTP is that you cannot have cross database transactions. So what that means is if, if you have uh, memory optimized tables in your user database and you create a transaction using one of those memory optimized tables, and then you try to query TempDB metadata in the same transaction, you will get an error. Um, so it, it doesn't mean that you can't leverage temp tables with your memory optimized tables. You can. The temp tables themselves are on disk. But if you try to query the metadata, you may get an issue. So for example, if you try to select star from sys objects to see if a temp table exists, that type of thing may fail. If you're just using like, um, if you're just using like one of the functions like object ID or something like that, that should work okay. But if you're trying to directly query the tempdb metadata in the same transaction as a user memory optimized table, then you will have uh, you'll have an error, and that's all documented. I I'm, I made sure to document any of those uh, limitations in um, in docs. Okay. Um, any additional guidance on C mem thread weights? We're on 2014 today without a firm timeline on upgrading 2019. Okay. So C mem thread weights happen in a lot of different areas. Um, essentially what the issue is, is that um, if you've got a large number of threads, there are some memory objects in SQL server where we only have one global memory object that, that all of those different threads are all trying to access at the same time. So when you're seeing C mem thread weights, it's usually that there's contention on a memory object. Um, so it could be contention on the temp table cache object, or it could be something else. The only way to know for sure would be to, um, to open a case with CSS. So most of those type of, um, of scalability issues were addressed in later versions of SQL Server. Some of those have been backported to 2014. So if you're on 2014, I, the, the best I can encourage you to do is just make sure you're on the latest service pack and the latest cumulative update. Um, because uh, all of th those are usually not something that you can address by workload. It's, it's usually a, a scalability issue within the engine itself. Okay, I'm getting clarification on another question. Okay. I'm not 
not quite sure what the question is, but um, and by the way, if question, anyone has just general questions on SQL 2019, I'm also happy to address those as well. Fair enough. Um, Got to thank you for the answer. So. Okay. If you have a system with limited memory and this query is executing, it may impact other queries that use memory. So is there a way to allocate like memory specific to this like uh, you would degrees of parallelism? Yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. Um, so um, it, it's not gonna directly impact your query memory. You're right, it is going to take some memory, but keep in mind that it's not your temp tables that are in memory. It's just the metadata. So it's usually a relatively small amount of memory. There actually is a way if you if you really feel like um, it's using too much memory, you can actually start it in a, um, in a resource group. So um, you can specify um, a, um, a resource pool and you can start the the um, memory optimized tempdb metadata and bind the tempdb to a resource pool. So you you can actually do that if you um, if you're concerned about memory, um, and all of that configuration is documented. I don't have enough experience to give you re real good recommendations on how much um, memory you 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 should allocate for it, because again, it's really heavily dependent on your workload. Um, but it is a possibility to bind. Um, a resource governor to tempdb when you turn this on and all of that is in the um it's in the configuration so here i just showed you the simple ultra server configuration set tempdb metadata on there is an option to specify a resource pool here as well excellent that was exactly what he was uh asking about mm -hmm. it looks like although i have to be honest with you in our testing you have to drive this thing pretty darn hard to to get to get the memory consumption to drive up. Like you have to have a really heavy workload. So I yeah, think for more, you so. probably wouldn't have to worry. Yeah, yeah. It'd have to be a huge number of uh, system tables. Yeah, well, yeah. Not right, only that, but you have to have a huge, a really high amount of concurrency because. If you're reusing things from the cache, then you're not going to be creating new tables. So it happens when you have massive concurrency, like hundreds of concurrent sessions all like doing temp table operations at the same time. So it, it really requires a, a specialized workload, not just a heavy workload, but a highly concurrent temp TV heavy workload to drive that number up. Great. Um, looks like that was all of the questions so far, unless somebody is furiously typing and we can't see. <laughs> okay, well, I'll go through a couple of my wrap up slides then. Okay, so why is TempTV causing me pain? The um, summary of that is everything gets dumped into TempTV. So many things leverage TempTV for temporary storage. Um, you might be having object allocation contention, you might be having metadata contention, and the way you will know which of those you're having, if any, is by looking at the sessions that are waiting if they're waiting on page latch and the wait resource is a tempdb page then you're facing one or both of those issues so what are we doing about it uh 2019 improvements memory optimized tempdb metadata as well as the other temp table cache improvements and concurrent pfs updates okay so so those are the big things in 2019 mm -hmm. If you're not in 2019 yet, and you don't have the ability to go to 2019, then my best recommendation is again, follow those best practices that have been out there for a while. Um, also, um, make sure you're on the latest service pack and cumulative update, because some of these improvements have been backported um, via cumulative updates. So you wanna make sure you're on the latest version to take advantage of all of those improvements. And of course, there are some workload changes you can make to encourage temp table cache reuse. So making sure that you're using stored procedures and making sure that you're not modifying temp tables, all of those things can help um, improve performance um, if you can't upgrade to 2019. Okay, um, just a couple of different resources. Um, we have a ton of short links. We like to create short links for everything. Um, so, uh, download and try SQL Server 2019. Um, so the What's New page covers everything that's new in 2019, all of the, the new good features, including this TempTV and everything else. Um, we've got some demos out there, out on, um, there's two main GitHub repos where we publish stuff. We've got the Tiger Toolbox, which is useful tools. And then we've got the SQL Server samples repo, 
Um, and that's where you'll find most of our demos. So data demos, IQP demos, IQP stands for intelligent query processing. So that's Pedro's area. Um, and then I mentioned this link a couple of times, SQL 2019 notebooks. Um, if you if you haven't played with Azure Data Studio yet, please download it. It's a free download. It works cross-platform. You can even run it on a Mac if you're using a Mac. Um, it is like, it, there's so much cool stuff in there and notebooks are just super handy. I'm doing all my demos in notebooks now because it's, it's just so nice to be able to um, kind of write out text and the demo in the same uh, notebook and then just run things directly from it. It's just really cool. Um, shameless plug for my book, uh, Pedro Lopes and I wrote a book together last year. So my book about learn T-SQL querying, where we talk about, um, it, that's mainly about um, query performance. Um, <laughs> one shortcut to rule them all, uh, Pedro really loves short links. Um, so he created a short link for all his short links. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> SQL shortcuts will give you all of the shortcuts that, that um, that he's created and, and useful ones. I even have a shortcut for, I wrote a blog on TempTV a couple of years ago. I, I think it's aka.ms slash SQL TempTV blog or something like that, or maybe just TempTV blog. Um, so uh, yeah, lots of good stuff there. And then um, aka.ms slash SQL workshops. If you're new to 2019 and you really wanna do some deep learning, especially if you've got time now since everybody's working from home, SQL Workshops is a, a, um, a series of workshops that was put together by uh, Bob Ward and Buck Woody and Anna Hoffman. And there is just, I mean, it is just great content. If you want to get learning on SQL 2019, including big data clusters, this is the best. It's again, it's kind of no, nope, it's notebook based. It uses containers. So it's like, it, you, it's really easy to walk through. You can just like spin up a container and then run SQL Server in there. Um, and uh, just really great content there at aka.ms slash SQL workshops. So if you want to get learning on 2019, that's a great place to start. That's it. My question slides. Uh, there looks like no questions. A couple of people said, so Mala mentioned that your book is a lot of uh, on many best practices, not just T-SQL queries, worth, worth the purchase. So you got yeah. the positive review there. <laughs> Thanks, Mala. Yeah, so um, yeah, it, it was supposed to be about T-SQL, but Pedro and I thought that that would be boring. So we made it about a whole bunch of performance topics. Um, it's a passion of both of ours. Um, and and I don't know if you guys don't know, Pedro Lopes is the PM that's in charge of like, um, he along with Joe Sack handle query processing and the um, like query plans and the query engine and all of that. So like it's, it's perhaps one of the most definitive um, guides to execution plans because we documented almost every single thing that you see in, a doc in an execution plan. Um, stuff that's probably not even <laughs> documented in our own documentation. So, yeah, shameless plug. <laughs> well, great. It looks like uh, no wrap-up questions. You've been able to handle them all tonight. Okay, great. Well, if anybody ends up with follow-up questions, like say you start going through the notebook and you end up um, having questions, do feel free to um, tweet at me on Twitter. That's usually the easiest way um, to get my attention. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions if anyone has them. Also, um, I will be doing this same presentation at the 8KB virtual conference that's coming up in a couple of weeks. I think it's June 17th is the date. Um, yep. So if anybody wants to kind of watch this again, and um, if, if, you know, if some of that went over your head and you want to do your own research and then come back to it, um, yeah, feel free to sign up for that conference. I'll be doing this uh, again. Well, excellent. With that, we are going to wrap up for this evening. Thank you so much, Pam, for your time tonight. Great session, everybody. Everybody loved it. Everybody loved it. Okay, good stuff. Happy to be here. Hope everybody has a good night. All right, thank you. And as we wrap up tonight, thank you all for attending. Next week, regular schedule in terms of packetness. So we've got Shop Talk on Monday, and then on Tuesday, Melissa Coates is going to deliver a brand new talk on administering, so administration in the Power BI world. So uh, stop on by, check that out next week. And until then, everybody take care.